Education Monday, Education Monday on the Tribal Root Studio with Alina Zahil. Changing mindsets in Africa, making a world better. Together, we can make a difference. We are fixing Africa. Education Monday. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, this is the Tribal Root Studio. My name is Alina Zahir. And today, I have a visitor brother in studio. He will introduce himself to us. Uh, but today we want to talk about uh, Russia and Ukraine. What is happening in the world and the implication it has for most of the people and especially for Africa. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen a lot going on. But before I go ahead, please remember to subscribe to this channel and leave your comment. Uh, if you want us to address anything, please uh, make sure to leave that comment there. Like, share, and make sure that uh, this good work is being spread all over the world. Uh, this is the Tribal Root Studio once again. Um, my brother, I want you to introduce yourself to the viewers. Yeah, hello, um, greetings to you. My name is David, David Baraza. I'm very happy to be on the show today. Thank you. So we are talking about Russia. Russia a few days ago invaded Ukraine and fighting is ongoing and there is so much hype of the war coming from the West. Uh, there are many things that are not understood. We don't know what, which is the truth and which isn't. According to you, what do you think people need to know about? What's happening between Russia and Ukraine? The current state between uh, Russia and Ukraine um, is, in a way, a perfect critic of probably what happened in the Cold War back then in the 80s, or maybe even what happened in 1962 when um, the president back then, Khrushchev, uh, took missiles to Cuba and the US was. Russia to have to move away from Cuba. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's not really new. This is something that has happened before. Most recently, even in 2014 in Crimea, like we all saw. So this is not really something that is new. So like the USA had to tell Russia, don't move close to Cuba. And right now, Russia is saying USA don't move close to, to Ukraine. Ukraine. Uh, well, and that's maybe, that's the most important, interesting part of this dialogue here, this conversation. I mean, it is one way of a bully over the other. Probably America being the outright bully of the world, and now perhaps it's running to the hands of Russia, like it has always been doing, yet again, to bully it. So I strongly believe that um, in this case, um, America and perhaps the NATO is trying to effectively assert. And like we had in Joe Biden, uh, Joe Biden's campaign manifesto a few years ago mm -hmm. or other months ago, um, this is a very strong part of his manifesto that. He is he is here to water down Russia. He is here to break it down. He is here to like what they did to the Soviet Union or the USSR, break it down in many ways. In this case here, yeah, I believe that um, America, in a way, and maybe the West, Western Europe, and the rest, are in a way trying to use Ukraine as a scapegoat to really break down Russia as just an instrument of asserting their international bullyship being a bully. Wow. Yeah. So these are very strong allegations, but in a way I strongly believe so. Um, well, Russia is very interested in annexing Ukraine, I would say that. Mm -hmm. But this maybe did happen before, and this is very key. We should not forget that Russia has every strong vitality they need to go against Ukraine and annex it. Just the way China tried to annex, to annex Taiwan. Taiwan. Yeah. So in a way, um, like, like we saw, um, when um, China wanted to annex Taiwan and due to hostilities here and there, they ended up providing the perfect cushion for Taiwan to be a strong republic and resist China. Um, this is one of very much another similar scenario whereby the US and America, America in general, Canada and the West, mm. and the Western Europe is trying to strengthen the resolve of Ukraine against a bigger power, which is Russia. So we feel like this is a domesticated, protect, protracted fight that has happened from before. We saw the USSR in Afghanistan and it ended badly when still the US goes to Afghanistan and mm -hmm. 
makes the USSR vacate and when you know what follows that, mm -hmm. USSR actually collapses. So I believe um, in a way maybe um, America is just playing an old game in a different era. The mm -hmm. same same thing okay. of trying to fight down Russia. So somehow um, I see that the most of the Western media, mm -hmm. whatever they are broadcasting, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know how you would term it, but it looks like they are at the point where they convinced the whole world that Putin, President Vladimir Putin, is mm. this is the worst guy. Mm. Like they have also tried to to say this is another Hitler. Mm. They're now trying to to show the world to show us mm. that we are faced with another Hitler mm. in this age. Yeah. What do you think of that? Well, I think that is far-fetched, that is uh, quite close to wrong or wrong itself. I'm, I, on the other hand, like I've told you before, I strongly believe that Hitler is the greatest leader that we've had since perhaps the Second World War, in a way. Really? And because of that, we may, may be being great. That means that um, he could have been on the level of Hitler in greatness, but not really like Hitler doing what Hitler did. So he's a great man, great respect, but not like Hitler. So um, Putin also, I need to effectively assert, has been very anti-war, has mm. been a very great friend of many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. He, I can actually ask any wishful thinking individual to suggest only one war that Russia has fledged in ever since Putin became a president. Mm -hmm. I really don't think so. I mean, all the wars have been protected between the U.S., instigated by the U.S., against Putin's office. Mm. And we have never seen any single time, like even the people before, maybe um, Yeltsin, President Yeltsin, Boris, mm. or maybe others, um, who maybe would have, like I was telling you before, uh, President even Khrushchev who tried to move missiles to Cuba, uh, mm -hmm. close to the coast of Florida. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are people who have been worse than Putin, but really don't know why Putin is the outright he's the, Hitler. He's the Hitler. Yet they've, they've been worse people than him in one way or the other. So I do believe that, yes, the media will do its part, and I'm not having to um, go head on with the media in any way or what, but I stru truly strongly believe on um, the ideals of objectivity and reason. Yeah, the use of logical facts and not really intuition or emotional. Um, sensations to really woo the public against um, President Hitler in a way. Mm. Actually, in a way, I do respect the autocracy and self-determination, sorry, the, the auto-determination of um, um, Hitler. Oh, so what is it Vladimir Putin? <coughs> Let me do that again. Mm -hmm. So, in a general context, I do respect the self, the autonomy and self-determination of Russians as a country in respecting their leader and loving him in a way. So whatever the media in any way smears about Putin, I do believe that, well, he wouldn't have been re-elected in the second time in 2012. Is it 2012 when he got elected? For the second time, after being president in 1999, mm. to 12, yeah. Yeah, you know, and still, even on top of that, giving him the right to stand up to 2036. So I do, don't believe in any way he could be um, any close to what the media strongly related to the Nazi infection of Europe or um, the socialist fascist groups that happened in the early 1930s. So in a way, I, much as I'm a fan of um, and great ardent lover of um, Vladimir Putin and everything, um, I do recognize that he has been pro-peace he has been a very strong um, initiator of dialogue between the U.S. actually and many parts that the U.S. has led war into. We saw that most recently in the war that was protracted in Libya by Vladimir's office and many other um, high leading officials in Russia. Effectively put it that there is no need to fight the U.S. over Libya but rather for Libya to have dialogue and peace. Answer their long-standing confrontations using dialogue. And we saw that actually in this case, the real Hitler, or maybe for use of a better word, that the US provided the toxic side in this war, that, and NATO itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in this case, 
um, following the chronology of events um, as we have known, um, NATO, NATO is very much interested in having Ukraine become a part of it so that they make it more powerful in a way so that maybe when you have a power against next on the board of another power, you know, that could actually cause a war in there or something like that. So, okay, yeah. uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I heard uh, President Putin in those first days mm. before the invasion, mm. he mentioned something called denazify. Yeah. He said, when I get into Ukraine, mm. I'm denazifying mm. Ukraine. Mm. What, what do you think that was meant to say? Well, I, I think just a few um, since statements back, I said, we know who the real Hitler is. And um, I just wouldn't want to say it here, but when Hitler actually says it, so it points the direction to who the real are Hitler you, are is. Are you saying Putin? So, no, because um, it's actually Putin saying it, that mm -hmm. he wants to be Nazify. So meaning there's another Nazi there's another Nazi in Ukraine. And well, as much as I, that, I believe that is so crude a statement, he should not have said it as a peace loving individual still. But I do accept and understand that that is the will of the Russian people, and he represents that whole talk. So, if he says that he's trying to denazify a state that um, probably people view as something else, so many there's something he has seen, and or something like that. So, either way, we also have to understand that um, Putin has been in Crimea, which is still. Um, a shelved portion of Ukraine for a long time, since 2015 when they had that peace accord. And all. But he has not really interested in trading into Ukraine up to now. So I really don't see why we see him as so very interested in a war with the so-called Nazis in Ukraine if it wasn't really something that has been instigated. Well, a few sources have actually said that um, this whole war was instigated by, you know, these are claims that Perhaps the U.S. could have bombed those the first missiles that we saw a few about two weeks ago um, on the eastern border of U Ukraine, and maybe they are trying to paint a picture that it's the worst going. Yeah, that is actually Putin bombing this since he has a military base. I actually, close to that. I actually remember mm. when I think uh, a few days to the invasion, mm. uh, uh, we saw uh, troops. Mm coming out of uh, Ukraine, mm. like it looked like they were getting out and mm. going back to Russia yeah. in large numbers. And it gave so many people some hope that there was no, go there was no war going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And um, the US President, mm. Biden, mm. and uh, Boris Johnson of UK, mm. they kept reassuring the people mm. that a war is coming. Mm. They kept telling the people that we are sure that Putin is going to attack. Mm. Well, uh, on that, I, I find that, yes, as much as it has happened, it, 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 like that's a really, very important cause of war and maybe a very serious circumstance that we need to understand. Um, though, I also need to state that, yes, like you might also be thinking, I don't think a war is really imminent and Putin is really interested in this war. Um, I actually do understand that Putin has been a very strong scholar of war, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps among the greatest leaders in the world right now. He could be the most educated about war. And Putin himself actually understands that if you went to a war with the NATO, you might lose. Uh, um, now, this is very serious. I'm not trying to say any kind of cowardice or what, but we know according to military strategy and what a few. Um, in some um, information that have been imbibing in the recent, recent past, um, you realize that um, war is actually won by the ability of countries to purchase ammunition. Uh, weapons, ammunition mm -hmm. and Simply in economics, what you'd call the PPP, purchasing power parity. Mm -hmm. And also, maybe also you might say population. Yeah. Um, how many people in your country? Mm -hmm. So let's say if you brought it closer, say, Uganda would want to fight the U.S. Uganda has a population of about 46 million and the U.S. has about 330 million. So we would know who would lose just because of that. Yeah, so he knows. Yeah, so in this case, um, Russia has about 140 million people. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a big country. Um, but the U.S. has 330 million. So yeah, you know, half. so he has like half of what half the U.S. has in terms of population. Mm -hmm. Also in terms of purchasing power parity or even let's start with GDP. Uh, U.S. has, a, uh, I think, the highest GDP in the world of 26 trillion, 
and Russia has a GDP of about 1.4 trillion. Mm -hmm. You know, but but, but I see that so the US mm -hmm. is trying by all means to convince the whole world mm -hmm. that the war is between Russia and Ukraine. Yes, of course, that is the, the art of war has been based all along. Like you may have read in some literature over here, the great Chinese Mao Zedong on propaganda. Um, trying to paint a picture that you're not really ready to fight, but you're actually fighting. And we know that most geopolitical wars have been fought through proxies mm -hmm. and not really going loggerheads. I, I think it was the same in the First World War when mm -hmm. the great um, Ferdinand King, um, I don't know if you, if you remember how the First World War started, mm -hmm. the killing of the, um, the Catholic um, fella in Austria that led to this and that. For any reasons, that actually caused the greatest wars on earth. And the Second World War, the same thing, you know, reasons that are hidden behind, you know, not really direct was engaging. So the big powers actually come as the latter solutions in the war, like to fight late. Yeah. So in this case, it could also be the same that Ukraine is being used as a scapegoat to fight Russia. Then maybe when the US would see that Russia is mm. losing, or NATO, they would have to come and assist it mm. and make a full fledged war. But still, I strongly believe that there is no war. And Putin would not even go into a war. Still, I was telling you, look at their GDPs, look at their numbers, and, like I told you, purchasing power parity. Well, the US has a purchasing power parity of about 60 trillion. Russia has a uh, PPP of about 4.7 trillion. So that means, in any case of a war, the US would be able to afford more missiles, more bombs. I, I, I also, so also recall, yeah. I also recall, I recall Putin mm. uh, before the invasion. Yeah. He said that he understands properly yeah. that he cannot fight with Ukraine, yeah. USA, and NATO combined, yeah. and the whole of Europe. Yeah. So he said, but he understands one thing: that he has the the most powerful nuclear mm. well, capacity. Yeah. That is like, when he said that, of course, everyone would think like this, this guy is trying to threaten or to try to, to be irrelevant. Yeah. But then a few days after saying that, then he invades Ukraine. Yeah. I don't see how anyone shouldn't uh, pay attention to Putin's statements, if you have been following every statement yeah. he makes. So, so, so you see, um, Putin over the years has been known as a very controversial fellow. Mm -hmm. Many. Most recently, we saw it in the COVID time, whereby he came and and yeah. And by the way, he said he also yeah. said, "I'm not, in, I'm not going to Ukraine. I'm not invading." And mm -hmm. the next day, he was there. Well, uh, Putin has been that controversial. He's always a controversial person. So his moves are actually so hard to read if you follow him by his word. Mm -hmm. Like I was telling you, even the COVID um, era where he was the first to come up with the vaccine and oh yeah, his vaccine had a very bad cure rate mm -hmm. and all those. I mean, very bad immunization. Um, efficiency and all that. So realize that he is a very contradictory, controversial human being mm. in his thinking and his talk. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I do believe that um, Putin, in a way, like I told you, is not really interested in the war because if he really meant that, he would have said it. And what, what did you ask him? Sorry. He asked. He said. I understand going to war with Ukraine, US and NATO, mm -hmm. I would lose. Yeah. And he also said, but if you keep doing what you're doing to mm -hmm. me, threatening my country, security and sovereignty, mm -hmm. there would be no winners in this mm -hmm. because I am the most, I am the country with the most powerful nuclear Capacity. Well, I don't know, but if you went through prominent sources, even on your phone or your internet, you'd realize that the U.S. has the largest number of warships, in the, I mean, nuclear warheads in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And so I really, I find that perfect. I don't know, maybe we'll quantify it, but in any way, uh, Putin will have to really provide us with more light on that if he really has the features. <laughs> so I find, it, I find it more as rhetorical in any way. It's part of diplomacy. It's how things are handled. Mm -hmm. But also in the brighter context, I do believe that maybe if he said that, it could have maybe justified the reason why he would walk into Ukraine. Though I still believe he wouldn't want to annex Ukraine. Now, I think I told you that uh, Ukraine is, is 
a very strong export agriculture exporter of mm. food, mm. particularly wheat in Europe, mm. um, as known by the EU facts and everything. Mm -hmm. So, and on the other hand, um, Russia is having all this condemnation and um, sanctions to trade and being knocked out of the G8, which is now G7, and all those issues. And also, among many other things, China having its prominence in the world. So the EU, um, the Russia in a way would be so very much interested in having Ukraine bring a, a close economical contact to them through the use of fear or terror. Among many things, like we already seen, uh, maybe uh, Mia marching in towns of Kiev, and or maybe many other things that may happen. So. <clears throat> I do believe that Russia, in a way, might be so very interested in enforcing a relation, either by fear or by proxy, okay. with Ukraine, just to, as, to tap into that, so that they can also benefit. We all know that Russia is a winter country, not a yeah. very strong agricultural country. Mm -hmm. They rely on other things, logging and many other things, mm -hmm. for their economy to succeed. So I believe Ukraine, which is actually a temperate environment, would be a very, very strong part. Though, still, I believe that if it really wanted, if Russia really wanted Ukraine, it would have bought it a long time ago. So it's a mixed um, combination of both. I believe that the best um, person who would enter into Putin's mind would actually tell us what's going to happen. But it's really, really complicated. And we saw the president of Ukraine, mm. Zelensky, mm. say he feels abandoned. Mm. He feels like the world hasn't really come to my aid. Mm. Where's USA? Where are the other nations? Where's mm. UK? Mm. Like he's fighting on his own with his soldiers. Well, and that was like a repeated statement. That is a very strong and um, a statement that you'd have to take with great caution. Mm -hmm. Because it's not the first time a Ukraine president is weeping at the feet of Vladimir Putin. It happened before in 2014, so with uh, Covid and all those people saying the same thing and later his resignation and what. So I believe that anything is possible even at this time. When President Zelensky happens to say anything as that, I really accept the great gravity and intensity of that statement. It could also mean that Ukraine is not interested in the war. It's part of also diplomacy in a way, international relations. I mean, having to eat the humble pie and make Putin look like, well, you are winning, so you, you have to come easy, go slow, don't really cause too much trouble. But also, in a way, trying to show the international community that is not ready to answer to the demands of NATO and the West, who might be interested in the war. Uh, and way. Putin actually mm. threatened him, yeah. say, if you join NATO, I'm mm. coming for you. Well, <laughs> NATO has faced a lot of controversies in the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. And let's just peer deep into from um, Donald Trump's time whereby he wants to exit the NATO. Um, and that was a very popular belief by most Americans who believe that America doesn't need NATO. And where then now we are seeing America is interested in NATO and they're trying to get um, Ukraine and many other small parts of Georgia and what into the mm -hmm. um, the NATO. So NATO has always been a controversial um, um, context for Europe and in particular for Ukraine. And we wait to see if really even Ukraine is interested in joining it, because on the backdrop of you and uh, the US that provides the biggest funding to NATO, wanting to exit it, we don't really know if Ukraine in any, in any way is also interested in joining it. But anyway, we see um, people in the west of Europe, particularly Boris Johnson and others, really calling for Ukraine to join. So we believe that. I think this is also a war of um, England, sorry, the UK, um, France, and many other states in the west of Europe um, trying to put a direct attack on all members that are not part of the EU. And the, the, that European Union? Not European Union. NATO? So, are you going to cut that? Yeah. So I believe, um, in a way, this is um, an attack of particular members of the EU against other members of the EU that may not be providing um, enough foothold on the table of the EU. We've been seeing a lot of these issues happening ever since the um, 
um, um, the, the, the Chancellor, um, Angela Merkel, yes. down, who was more of the, the, the feminine side, the soft landing in the Europe and all mm. that kind of, um, and she had a also good connection with Vladimir Putin. We all know that actually Putin mm. even speaks German in a way, so mm -hmm. we believe that Putin lost his place in Europe mm -hmm. and Angela. everybody sees him as also an antagonist to the development and so they're trying to get everyone close. According to the 1823 Monroe Declaration, Doctrine rather, um, one of um, the statements was that for a superpower to have another strength and stronghold next to its border to be considered as something close to an act of war. So we also see when the east of when the west of Europe and NATO and, and rather the US are interested in putting asserting a stronghold close to Russia, they could be trying to send a message to Russia that maybe it's time for um, us to go look ahead. And okay, I have also I have seen uh, comments from the Republican Party mm. uh, of USA, mm. uh, particularly Trump, mm. uh, the former president. Mm. Uh, his comments seem to assert that the the current president, uh, the Democratic president, uh, President Biden, is weak, mm. and that's why Putin would do whatever he is doing. And uh, he says, if I was president, mm. this was never going to happen because he would never dare mm. do such a thing in my presence. He knows. Who I am. <laughs> on the other, on the other end, we have seen also Trump uh, on Fox News. Mm -hmm. We have seen him uh, praising Putin praising for Putin. whatever he's doing. <laughs> so, like here, you're telling us, if I was president, mm -hmm. you wouldn't do that, mm -hmm. but you're still praising him for mm -hmm. doing that. So, so we we are we are seeing this happening in USA mm -hmm. in the Republican Party with the former president. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? Well, that's a joking subject. Uh, when it comes to the politics of the U.S., we all know that it's a mixed context of joy, laughter, and a little bit of anger. Um, so, let's joke again, anyway. Um, if we all know that the U.S. is surrounded by water on the left and the right, mm -hmm. Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, right, so, let's say, if there was a kind of Ukraine close to maybe uh, New York, or let's say even California or the West, and Russia went there and tried to instigate a war mm -hmm. there, would um, President Biden yield to that kind of pressure as Putin is yielding? So I believe that provides, provides us with a close contrast. You can actually oh. talk about Mexico. Now uh, Mexico rather, even that's even enough. And we even saw in the Bay of Pigs invasion, <laughs> uh, which is interesting. And, you yes. know, so, um, I do strongly believe that the structure of the U.S., political structure, and their military agenda has been strongly protected by the mere fact that they don't have any nearby standing places for invasion. Yeah. And we've seen that. Like I told you before, when Khrushchev moves his missiles to Cuba, which is 140 kilometers far away from the coast of Florida, yeah. that was enough for the USA to cry and to mm -hmm. go to the U.N. or among many other bodies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I do strongly believe that Russia, or even the Soviet Union as it was, the USSR, have been very advantaged to have very great leaders, leaders that maybe even the US maybe may not have had, and um, the current case in Joe Biden, and when we hear all these things, at one point there are jokes, but also I believe we can joke further. And just <laughs> say that, um, we can joke further. So yeah. um, uh, it was intriguing to me to see a president Trump mm -hmm. praising Putin mm -hmm. and then having the rest of the Democratic <laughs> Party members saying mm -hmm. Putin is the worst person, he's killing people. Mm -hmm. And then now let's talk about double standards. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen America go into many <coughs> countries mm -hmm. and actually destroy the countries mm -hmm. to the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, you, t you can talk about Afghanistan, you can talk about Iraq, you can talk about Libya. You can talk about Syria and many others. Mm -hmm. Now, I think most of these countries was not a point of you are in a neighborhood and you're trying to pose some insecurity. Mm -hmm. No, 
some of these, like Libya, mm. like America has to come from Africa, from America with mm. NATO and come to Africa and do whatever they did, mm. kill a president, kill the people. Mm. And by the way, we didn't see so much outcry yes. of uh, saying, you're killing people of Libya. Mm. The way we are saying now, mm. Putin is killing the people of Ukraine. Mm. We didn't see such outcry. Mm. Uh, you also know about the war in Congo. Mm. It has taken more than six million people's lives yes. for the last more than mm. 20 years. Mm. We haven't seen so much outcry in mm. the world, yeah. in the mainstream media, mm. talking about you're killing people yeah. and you're a bad guy. Yeah. So why is it that with Putin, yeah. in three days, yeah. he's starting to be compared to Hitler? Well, I think that is a canonical fact of philosophy that if um, people are talking about you, that means you have a very serious cause. So I also do understand that, yes, <coughs> Russia, the Russian war, the Russia-Ukrainian war that maybe the U.S. is involved in would gather the huge attention of uh, the media and the world and other things. And, well, the capitalism part of the media would set in that we know who owns the media, um, the U.S. and companies in the U.S. on the media, among many other things. So, mm -hmm. so this much linking and unintended um, hula balu would have to slowly creep in, and yes, it would happen as it is. So, and um, because actually you'd also ask about the same um, when um, China was invading invading um, Taiwan. We saw okay, the media was there, but it wasn't um, as much. It wasn't as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see, so I do believe. That, that this correctly pinpoints the strength of Vladimir Putin and if it's really a threat or not. Okay. Now, I, I do accept for a fact that Putin is not interested to fight, like I already told you. And in any way, in any way, I do understand that, that the media will run and actually die in their, of their own medicine and um, that in this war, the war will be pushed to the arms of um, China, mm -hmm. and China will get involved in this war. Mm -hmm. Already we saw um, a few days ago, China was um, buying oil in Chinese-dominated fields, mm -hmm. and instead of the US dominated fields. And imagine how much, of, um, the, how much oil Russia has, so that's really quite a lot of money, so it would rather provide the strength of Russia against the US. Mm -hmm. And that would weaken the U.S. and the U.S. would feel like this is because of China. So if this would push the war, the balance of war between Russia and China, r between Russia and the U.S. to U.S. and China. And we would end up seeing U.S. and China fighting and the media would still go back to what we saw before. And they would misreport, they would underreport that story. And so the headlines would actually die out on their own. So about the media, I do believe that as much as they might do, Putin is very smart and Yes, the given the publicity needs to keep being the second most powerful man on earth after the Pope and among many other things, but in any way he is not interested in the war and the media will run into a story where, where it is US, China, like we saw before it was US, US North, North Korea and later it became US China in the middle of that model. Okay. So also US Iran and later it mm -hmm. became US China. Mm -hmm. Oh well, but also I'm putting the media aside, um, facts, um, like I also told you about the statistics of these countries. China has about 1.43 billion people, and the US has 330 million people. Mm. So you do believe that if the media is capitalist backed by the US, they wouldn't want to report a story against a country that is four times. I've actually seen some reports uh, a few hours ago mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where, like, um, these media platforms, is it, is it the New York Times or some of those? Mm. They are saying very many, many troops from Russia are dying in Ukraine. Yeah. And like, I saw like they are going to lose 50,000 troops mm. and President Putin doesn't care. Like I, I'm seeing those like a few hours ago. Well, I, well, we all know that the art of war is based on propaganda in any way. Mm. Um, speculative um, analysis and all that kind of talk. Um, but we know that the mental resolve of Putin has been sharpened so well to expect that he knows what the media is going to throw at him.
Yeah. And it's really sad for the rest of the world to live with this because we have a burden of facts and misfacts. Anyway, I don't know about 50,000 people dying in Ukraine. I don't know who will be killing them because we don't have any stand in NATO for them. So, uh, how, how about fight. the sanctions? Yeah. Do you think the sanctions would really, really impact Russia economically? I think it would actually strengthen Russia. In any way, let me use the words of um, Putin. Um, anyway, am I trading with the West? <laughs> okay, of course. So, uh, it was Putin really trading with the West? I really don't see. If in any way he's trading against the West, he's trading through pro proxies in Africa or the Middle East or in South America, countries that maybe the allies of Russia that the U.S. would not really want to impose sanctions on. For example, um, say, Turkey. I don't really think the U.S. would be ready to impose sanctions on Turkey, mm. but they do that to Russia. Mm. But in a way, if Putin reacted to these trade sanctions, America would catch a hold. Um, like I've told you before, Russia has a very is a, has been is a very key exporter of natural gas. I mean, the pipes that pass through Russia in the winter are very key to sustaining the, the U.S. economy and through Siberia and Canada, North America, the Great North America. So, if Putin decides with a strong of a finger to close down these tunnels or these pipes and what, because anyway, natural gas needs cold temperatures to uh, that are in Russia. If he decided to stop that, I uh, would see a shift in production in the U.S. that would catapult into perhaps something like a depression. So we'd get, end up seeing the outright winner that, yes, Putin will not gain, but America would lose. That's what he said. Mm. He said there are no winners in this. Yeah, you see. So uh, I've also seen some African leaders mm. coming out to condemn mm. uh, Russia yeah. with what is happening in Ukraine, mm. uh, like South Africa. Mm. I think I've also seen Kenya. Mm. I don't know which other African countries. Uh, why, why would it be necessary for these African leaders now to jump on, uh, on something that I think would be like mm. so far from them to understand? Um, and also considering that we have seen many conflicts in Africa, like serious conflicts, genocides, and sometimes these very African leaders are quiet and silent about. Let me give you a close backdrop to how African countries has been behaving, have been behaving towards Europe, or even the U.S. itself. In 2015, there was the Bataclan bombing mm -hmm. on, uh, in France. Mm -hmm. about, and then also we had the Charlie Hebdo attack mm -hmm. in France too. A few days later, about seven heads of state from Africa went to work on the Napoleonic group in France, in, Com in Resolve with um, the state of France mm. being bombed by terrorists and all that kind of stuff. Shortly after, about 2,000 people were bombed in Maiduguri, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And we didn't see anything, by, uh, that was by um, the Boko Haram. Mm. And we didn't see any response by international community or even African leaders the media in subject, mm. or even the media about that. Now that story subsided. I also want to talk about Somalia, Congo, I also wanted to talk about the 2014 Africa-US summit. Yes. Um, under the administration of the Biden administration. Mm. Um, when we had um, about 54 heads of state from Africa go to meet the president of the U.S. for an Africa summit. Mm -hmm. Well, that is quite paradoxical, right? Because it's an Africa summit, so we don't know why it's in America. So I feel um, African leaders are not really inept at an advancing the true resolve of Pan-Africanism and neocolonialism, the effect of neocolonialism in our postmodern world, um, that we are still hinged so, so intricately and joined at the hip with our colonial masters in terms of our media, in terms of our rhetoric, and even thought, our perception of things. Mm. So it, it is not even of a shock 
to see the great um, Galant ambassador of Kenya, Ambassador Mwangi, and even the South African and many other contemporaries in Africa who are joining the race to go and humiliate Russia with good English and rhetoric um, in all these meetings. Um, I, I, it's actually laughable as a, for a fact because these countries do not provide any strong stakes in this war, not even any trade. I don't see any way Russia has ever um, traded with Kenya before, not any visible trade. Um, so even though Russia condemns, the, uh, sorry, Russia is condemned by Kenya and South Africa, I don't really see any, any stress that would amount, that amount in effect. So Poland. it is... Africa is the world's second largest and second most populous... Hmm. This what? Hey, this guy just what had me speak. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, assistant. <coughs> no, so what were they talking about? So uh, let's talk about this. No, um, I'm still finishing. You were know? talking about Kenya and Russia. So I I do believe that this is all laughable. It's more of a joke. It's tantamount to nothing. And as we know, Kenya is a very strong U.S. ally. We so, saw. Uh, the most recent president of the United uh, Nations Security Council was the president of Kenya, and he had. A very uh, long stay in the US, meeting the president of the US exactly after the COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. So I do believe that this was also expected, though it is laughable. Um, like in the words of Putin, we know what he said. Um, we should really focus on our problems as Africa and not really lean to the problems of the West, in a way. Yeah. yeah. And everyone is trying to remind Africa. I've seen like most of the Pan-African platforms, mm. they are trying to remind Africa that Russia didn't really colonize Africa mm. compared to the rest of the West and Europe. Uh, you know anything about that? Um, well, that is interesting because Russia, in a way, was also a colony. So mm -hmm. and through the years, and the Tsars were all look from Napoleon Bonaparte's time to invasions by all these people, you know. So I don't think um, Russia would really have been in the state, the economic state, to advance their interests in Africa to colonize. But I also don't know if really they would have been interested in colonizing Africa in any way. But uh, what we see, I believe that the point of colonialism is still existent and it's continuous, it never stops. Yes. It's still happening and mm -hmm. probably you never know, maybe Russia is colonizing us right now. You also don't know. So, mm -hmm. but I do want to believe that um, Russia is on the lighter side of colonialism, that um, they have been made themselves clear. The, the Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has been always um, hitting out that um, they respect territorial integrity, they are not up to colonialism or providing protectorates or anything of sort. So I do believe that, well, that is a serious concern that Russia didn't colonize, but in any way, I don't think we should believe that colonialism ended. It That's, has. Yeah, I don't yeah. think. Yeah. Of course, what we see uh, happening in Africa with uh, all these wars and uh, plundering yeah. uh, is... is, is it's what tells us that there was a continuation to colonialism. Exactly. It may be happening in most sophisticated ways, yeah. but it is happening. Yes. yes. And, and I don't think most of the African leaders really care yeah. to see that truth for what it is and do what is right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the truth, the truth actually sounds like a lie to Africa. That's the, that's the, that's the bad point. And it's, um, I, I really believe that Africa is not even want to know the truth. That, um, the roads in Africa by Chinese companies or the hospitals that were at and having to school our kids in certain places of the world are actually impeding the concepts of Pan-Africanism and the idealistic acceptance of African values. I mean, sorry, um, um, the, uh, contributing to the eradication of our strong African heritage among many other things. So thank you for tuning in to the Tribal Roots Studio once again. Uh, my name is Alina Zahir and I've been with my brother Derek and please to remember to subscribe and if you like this video of course please remember to hit the like button. If you have anything you want us to address we will address it. Leave it in the comments. 
Thank you. Have a great day.